What can this cordless seven and quarter inch slide style miter saw do? And is it as precise as it aspires to be? On this episode of Tool Lab, we put it to the test to find out. Hi, I'm Chris Hermides from This Old House. A few years ago, I tested eight 10-inch dual bevel sliding compound miter saws and found one of Metabo HPTs to be among the most accurate of them. So I had high hopes for this cordless model, which is made in Japan. Full disclosure, while Metabo HPT did not sponsor this video, they did send us this saw to review with the understanding that we could speak freely about it and give our unbiased opinion. So that's what you're gonna get here. First, let's highlight some features. This saw can be run either cordless or corded, thanks to an AC adapter pack that powers a number of other Metabo HPT multi-volt tools. This level of flexibility is a really nice feature. The saw is packed with too many features to mention here, but some of the more notable ones include a dual bevel adjustment with rack and pinion micro dial, which is really nice for fine tuning your bevel angle. A belt driven soft start motor which yields impressive power and includes an electric brake. An accurate laser that can be adjusted to either side of the blade. A work surface light that has three settings and a forward facing fixed rail design giving it a very compact footprint and making it ideal for small work areas. With a price tag of $1,250 for the bear tool only, this is in the premium category and is aimed at professional carpenters. Folks that would benefit from a precision tool and one that's incredibly mobile. If you're not already on the multi-volt platform, a battery and charger will cost you $150 and an additional $150 to the AC adapter. So all in, you're looking at $1,550 to take full advantage of the saw's features and flexibility, which is a significant investment considering it's three times that of other cordless saws in the market. While those saws don't have the advantage of optional corded power, an extra thousand dollars is a significant spend. Now I tested the saw in a number of ways in the shop and used it in my work over the course of six months on tasks like installing maple flooring, building poplar face frames, installing mahogany decking, building 2x4 and 2x6 walls, and most recently when replicating some corbels in my house using 4x6 Douglas fir. I also had Kevin Barker from Sweener Builders put the saw to the test on his job sites. As for objective testing, I looked at the following. Cutting accuracy at 90 degrees where it performed exceptionally well. I was able to cut within 75 10 thousandths of an inch over 11 inches after four cuts which yields 19 10 thousandths of an inch per cut. I looked at bevel cutting accuracy at 90 degrees as well. This cut result was also nearly flawless. There was no arbor run out and there was no blade wobble, which I observed and also tested by comparing the kerf cut with the blade thickness of the teeth. I also observed some head deflection with the saw screwed down to the workbench. I was surprised at how much I could move the head. Kevin didn't see this movement show up in use on the job site and I didn't find it when I was using it either. I tested the saw's grooving feature where I struggled to make consistent cuts across a rabbit. I found this to be disappointing. Dust collection when hooked up to the dust extractor was decent, though the splinter guard was the weak point here, as you can see. What I found to be most disappointing, though, came when I tested the saw's ability to make opposing miter cuts. Now, Metabo HPT's 10-inch sliding compound miter saw is capable of performing this test flawlessly. This saw, however, was out quite a bit. I replicated this test multiple times, and Kevin did in the field as well, we both came up with the same results. Flawed cuts that couldn't yield a perfect square. There are a number of possibilities that could account for this level of inaccuracy because I've seen them in other saws. Some common ones include rails that are slightly out of alignment or bearings that don't ride on them properly. But none of those made sense given the results in the 90 degree testing. 
So after much time and testing, I finally discovered the issue. The detent on the right side is off slightly. And because there's no detent plate, there's no way to adjust for it without carefully setting the saw just shy of the 45 degree setting. But because there's no way to turn the detent override off permanently, it's very difficult to do. I know Metabo HPT has the capability to fix this as it appears to be an issue in the casting of the base. Here's what Kevin had to say about the saw's performance on his job sites. My name is Kevin Barker, Swinger Builders. So overall, where I see the saw really shining is for trim and finish carpenters. It's not really a framing saw. Seven and a quarter blade, we can cut a two, full two by 12 on a cross cut, and it doesn't bog down, but we do some light framing with it if we needed to. If we come over to the side of the saw, you notice that the miter scale is located on the right side of the saw as opposed to the front. This, I found, is a little bit of an annoyance. Um, there are also roof pitches on the left side. It's a pitch gauge on the left. If we come around too, you can see the height of the fence is super short. So if you're a guy who cuts crown and rolls it up on the fence like I do, you're gonna have some issues with that. Another thing that I've noticed is the dust bag. The dust bag really impedes your bevel lock in the back, especially when it heads down. And the dust collection system works pretty good. Easy on off, normal bag, zipper on the bottom. The runtime is phenomenal from what we've experienced so far. One 36 volt battery, a full battery will get you through a day. Right now we're doing some light trim work on the exterior and we haven't had any issues with uh, charges. Backing this thing up at the end of the day, pretty simple. Shut the lights off, the saw comes down, the rail slide, there's a locking bolt on the side over here. Lock your miter, pin right here, locks the head of the saw, doesn't come up. Make sure everything's good. So overall, nice compact, mobile, lightweight trim saw. I had similar experiences. I love the mobility, the power, and the quality of cut the saw provides, and there's no difference in performance when plugged in or running on the battery. Runtime on the battery is impressive. It's tough to quantify because runtime depends so much on what type of material you're cutting, but I found that when cutting Poplar 1 by and 3 quarter inch MDF, I was consistently surprised by how long it took for the battery to run out of charge. As a recap, at $1,250 for the tool only, the saw sets a high expectation for features and performance, and with a few exceptions, it does deliver. We like the compactness of the saw, the fact that it can run corded or cordless, it has impressive run time, it's incredibly accurate in all ways but the one 45 degree detent. We find the lack of onboard tool storage annoying and wish the side arms retracted into the table. And finally, we'd like to see more precision with the casting of the auxiliary fences that come with the saw. So there's room for improvement for sure, and at the price tag, there are things worth considering before you buy. I hope this review was helpful. Until next time, I'm Chris Hermides with This Old House. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. This old house has got a video for just about every home improvement project, so be sure to check out the others. And if you like what you see, click on the subscribe button to make sure that you get our newest videos right in your feed.